Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about youth and young adults in recovery. Joining us in our panel today are Tammy Barr, Assistant Director, Connections Counseling, Board Member of Recovery Foundation, Madison, Wisconsin. Jonathan Katz, Director, Rita J. Kaplan Jewish Community Services, Jewish Board of Family and Children's Services, New York, New York. Justin Riley, at large board member, Faces and Voices of Recovery, Seattle, Washington. Bridget Ruiz, Technical Expert Lead, Division of Systems Improvement, JBS International, Bethesda, Maryland. Bridget, 21.5% of 18 to 25 year olds have an issue with illicit drugs. Talk to me a little bit about that and what kind of drugs are they using? It's quite different than it was even two or three years ago. We see a, a huge increase in um, pharmaceutical drug use, um, not using it as prescribed. Um, we also see a, an increase in um, alcohol use and binge drinking is a serious problem as well as um, some of the um, more legal types of drugs um, labeled as um, incense or those types of things in different smoke shops. And Jonathan, is that hold true for what you're seeing in New York City? Absolutely. Uh, we're seeing the use of or the misuse of drugs such as Ritalin, uh, Adderall, Indorol uh, being used to uh, or for specific purposes to help kids uh, stay up late and study to calm kids down. We're also seeing a lot of binge drinking and we're seeing a disturbing kind of resurgence in the amount of uh, nicotine smoking. Uh, uh, I think kids are, use, uh, are resorting to cigarettes because they're, they're legal, uh, they're not super cheap, but compared to other kinds of drugs, they're, uh, they're certainly cheaper and readily available and that's, that's quite disturbing. And Tammy, let's talk about underage drinking a little bit more that Jonathan brought up. Talk to us about what is what is underage drinking. Well, you know, the drinking age is, is 21, so there's a lot of kids who start drinking at 13, 14, or 15 and don't really have experience um, or understand how to drink responsibly. Um, and so they end up drinking in very high-risk situations. Um, they usually have a limited amount of time that they can use, so they're drinking in, in large quantities, um, in binge drinking, and then becoming really intoxicated and having kind of all the risk factors that go along with that. Well, to be exact, there are about 10 million 12 to 20 year olds that are engaged in underage drinking, which is a staggering. From 18 to 20, you've got 48.9 percent, Justin, of those uh, cohorts are, are, are using alcohol. Um, talk to us about what you see in your practice and, and in the work that you've done in terms of how do kids get a hold of, of these substances and what are we looking at? Hmm. That's a great question. I think oftentimes kids and young adults, if you will, uh, find the alcohol in their own home, in their parents' home. Um, we, I've had several great conversations with families who didn't, were, weren't even aware that that was happening, that they kept alcohol in their home, moderate amounts of alcohol for regular social events, and uh, the children simply had access to it. And that, that was my experience personally growing up. Uh, my parents had alcohol, and that's where I got it from. And then met people who were old enough to purchase it for me, and it became a, just a, a kind of a cycle, and that's how we went about getting alcohol, and I see that uh, true today. How old were you at the time uh, when you started? When I first started drinking, I was 14 years old, and I found the alcohol. It was, uh, my friend and I found the alcohol in our parents' cupboard. And we and you had never your friend had never experimented or or he had already. I think that he had drank before, but that night was really about us figuring out what this alcohol thing was about. And we had watched so many other people do it, whether that was through media or just through our family. And you know, one of the things that the the audience needs to understand is that the, that just that one. Uh, experiment can become lethal if if the level right Jonathan if the level yeah. is 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 quite high and, sure. and and then one is not tolerating it sure we we actually use a, a film in some of our prevention work called death in in the ER about um, uh, someone who is um, near death because of alcohol poisoning 
So all of these substances essentially um, are among the many that they use. We also have um, another issue, which is um, depression and some uh, mental health problems, correct, Bridget? Absolutely, and oftentimes, especially in substance abuse treatment samples, we find that at least anywhere for, uh, percentages range from 30 to 90 percent have some type of co-occurring issue from depression to trauma, symptoms, those types of issues. So it's, it's a really um, significant um, issue that we all have to really take, assess for, and then be able to provide the treatment that young people need. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan, how does a parent understand uh, when there's a problem? What, what should parents be on the lookout for? Well, parents should be on the lookout for uh, changes in behavior, and I think that's kind of the, uh, the key uh, signpost that, that we tell people to look for, uh, a, a change in who your child is hanging out with, uh, how they're doing in school, uh, their involvement with activities. But I do want to em emphasize also that there are many young people who are very high achievers who nonetheless get uh, caught up in, in drugs and, and, and uh, as a way of dealing with the stress that they're under. I also want to uh, highlight something that Bridget said, which is very important, the uh, issue of trauma, because we see many young people who have experienced uh, physical, emotional, sexual abuse and are significantly traumatized by that, and that's, that's a very frequent co-occurring factor. And I think a lot of kids are looking for a way to feel better. And so when they drink and the first um, you know, experience that they have feels good and they don't feel as sad or they don't feel as depressed, they're not as worried about right. what happened yesterday, mm -hmm. um, that becomes uh, part of the cycle that they kind of continue with. And then it, it, it kind of has a life of its own, so it takes over after that. Tammy, you make up a very good point. They self-medicate, yeah. you know, to, to lower the, th the threshold of pain, you know, that they're experiencing. So parents really need to know, as well as the kids themselves, when they, when they go through one of these episodes, is it wise for them just to stop and say, why am I doing this? And, and for the parents, when, they, when they're confronted, as Justin was noting, uh, I, need, I need immediately to go to counseling and start getting some help for this child? I think early intervention is really, really important. So whether that's parents being able to pay attention um, and to, to ask questions if they notice something, um, if it's the school system or somebody else mm -hmm. that the, the child is coming into contact with, because the sooner that we can intervene with somebody, the less likely it's going to be a problem later on. Um, so uh, being able to identify that and seek support is really important. And okay. kids struggle. They don't know how to deal sure. with being adolescents, and they need support from parents and from the community to, to help them through that period. Absolutely, and, and I, I think, Tammy, that um, you know, many times parents actually do see something that concerns them and uh, because they're afraid or they don't know the answer, they, they, they are overwhelmed by it and too anxious about it, they don't take action and that, as you say, you know, leads to increasing problems. And by default, adolescence and transitional aged youth is just a huge period of risk taking. Right. And so parents may have a, a, not a good idea of when to intervene. Is this normal adolescent developmental behavior or is this a real problem that we need mm -hmm. to address? Justin, what are the consequences of all that we've talked about, of the issues that, that are facing youth and young adults? You know, what are the potential consequences to society? I would have to say, to begin with, the consequences are, I mean, they could be fatal. That It isn't just, I got in trouble or I got kicked off the tennis team or something of that nature. And to tie it back uh, to what Jonathan had mentioned, I was the captain of the tennis team. Mm -hmm. I was on the rotary. I had scholarships for leadership, I was in student council, and not only were those going to be consequences of my behavior, but also the loss of family. I mean, I had been to seven programs by the time I was 19 years old and was homeless and living in downtown Denver, mm -hmm. so. Well, when we come back, we'll take a look further into the issues of youth and young adults. We'll be right back.
The prevention field has really changed in the last 20 years since SAMHSA has been in existence. We understand much more about prevention science. We also understand that, frankly, the um, children who begin uh, having problems before age 14 are much more likely to have problems as adults. And children who use alcohol before age 21 are much more likely to have uh, a, a problems as adults. So we've also learned that there are risk factors and protective factors. It's not just what happens to a young person that may lead to substance abuse or suicidal thoughts or depression or anxiety but it's also the kinds of protections they have in their family, in their community, and in their social, um, in their school and others. It involves multiple parts of the community and all of those things have to come together to assist kids in getting the kind of assistance they need to be uh, the best decision makers and be able to manage issues as they go through adolescence and into adulthood. When we look at young people today, we understand that they have a, an advantage over uh, people in uh, earlier generations. They have access to modern technology. They have social networking. They have uh, smartphones. They have the internet. And the use of, high, of technology then allows them to uh, access questionnaires about their substance use, to participate in uh, social networking uh, support groups, and to uh, link up with electronic health records so, and, or their counselors, and to have online counseling if they're reluctant to uh, go to face-to-face -face counseling. So um, technology uh, offers a great deal of promise that uh, young people are more comfortable with and use on a, a regular basis. So uh, uh, this is a uh, revolutionary time for our youth and we hope to uh, take advantage of the technological advances to promote recovery. Where's mom? Did she forget me? I wonder what happened to her. What if I get left here? Drugs and alcohol may make you forget your problems for a moment, but that's not all you forget. My mother worked hard to be in recovery, and I love her for that. For drug and alcohol treatment for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I think one of the, one of the keystones or the next steps in moving forward for treatment programs and organizations and prevention services is to remove stigma around young people in recovery. I've now grown up um, for about five years now in, in recovery and have no qualms about sharing that with people. I think the, the openness of the younger generations can really be used to reduce that stigma and if done uh, strategically can really break this trend of people being bashful about talking about that, hey, yeah, I used to be a both guy, drug addict, alcoholic, mental health. I mean, I, I did it all, and today I don't, and, and this is how. And, it, and there's, I think, solution and hope in that. Jonathan, why is age of first use of any substance um, an issue in preventing both the illicit drug and alcohol abuse in later life? Mm -hmm. That's very important because of the developmental growth of, of young people and, and children. Uh, you know, the younger a child is when they, they start to get involved in some type of compulsive behavior, uh, the more it takes over and interferes with their ability to develop skills for dealing with issues, how to deal with frustration, how to solve problems, how to be resilient. And so they, they substitute, I think Tammy, you had mentioned that earlier, that they, they begin to substitute these behaviors, uh, the, the drinking, the drugging, the cutting, uh, eating issues, and that helps them feel good in the short run. So they neglect or they're, they're not able to develop the more uh, constructive skills. And um, Justin, in your case, did it not escalate into other more dangerous uh, activity and, and drug taking? It, it most certainly escalated and escalated very quickly. Mm -hmm. So with my first drink at 14 years old, by the time I was 16 and 17, I uh, started using cocaine, speed, really taking any prescription pill or, or anything that could alter my state of being. And I think you hit on a really key point, Jonathan, when you mentioned how how to cope with different things. Mm -hmm. I, I started to notice that not only 
I drank and used drugs when I was happy or sad or celebrating or lonely or afraid, it started becoming my go-to for any situation. Yes. I'm too tired, I need, I need help with the test. I mean, you know, that doesn't even make sense, but it became my solution for life. And let's talk a little bit about perceived risk. Obviously, a young um, adolescent um, or a child for that matter, how does one then begin to interject uh, perceived risk in that behavior that you just mentioned? Is that a factor? Is that a factor in prevention uh, for the parents to get mm -hmm. through to that child that there is a risk in, in, in this type of behavior? I think it's important to communicate to children and to young adults about the risks associated with that behavior. But as a young person who was participating in those behaviors, I didn't, I didn't take that into consideration. I didn't have any immediate negative consequences of what I was doing because I was still a, as we talked about earlier, I was still a young achiever and I wasn't seeing those negative results yet, but it caught up with me very quickly. Were your parents sending you messages about um, substances? Did they sit down with you? Were they, mm -hmm. did, did they speak to you about it? I remember hearing messages from DARE and GREAT programs, not only at home, but also in the classroom. My mother was a teacher and my, my mom and dad both advocated for, um, to not use drugs and alcohol. My sister, just as a quick example, had no problem with drugs and alcohol and to this day still doesn't. And so, which is a much larger discussion uh, of why me and not her, but I did receive anti-drug mm -hmm. messages at home. Tammy, how do we then begin to, to, to uh, develop approaches so that we can get to the youth and young adults at an earlier phase of, of their experimentation and, 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 and prevent some of these problems? Yeah, I, I think one of the most important things is to be able to find um, issues that are relevant for that person. So teenagers and, and young adults are, you know, they're risk takers by nature. Um, it, they're not gonna listen to authority. They're um, individuating and they're trying to figure out how to make decisions on their own. And so I, I, at least we find that when we're able to um, find something that's important to them, that motivates them, that that's a way to start talking about um, the risks that they might be experiencing, the changes that they might need to make in order to be successful, to reach the goals that they might have, and to really focus on um, personalized feedback, giving them information that's relevant to them instead of information that might be relevant to an adult or somebody who's older. Like, it makes sense to us that we shouldn't drink that much and, and throw up. Um, but for a kid, sometimes that's fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so being able to give them feedback that really relates to them, I think, is really important. And so, Jonathan, let's talk now about that's for for alcohol and drug issues. Mm -hmm. Children, you know, as we mentioned, also face depression and severe mental yes. illness. And how, what kinds of things can we begin to do to prevent the child from going into a, uh, or a young adult going into a downward spiral? That's a very crucial goal. And uh, uh, the uh, most recent research has shown, uh, as, as you mentioned, Tammy, that Early intervention is really critical, even with very severe types of mental illness, uh, schizophrenia, for instance, or other psychoses. Early intervention and helping people both uh, behaviorally, uh, learning skills to cope, and uh, sometimes uh, psychopharmacologically giving them medication can uh, really uh, be extremely effective in helping young people avoid falling into uh, a, a destructive pattern of behavior. And in, in terms of if the, if the parent really you know, there, there's a lot of literature coming in about the, the medicate, whether to medicate, not medicate. Yes. What can a parent be doing? Can they be doing anything to really help that child become better adjusted? I, I think that's crucial. You know, there, um, as as has been discussed uh, in, in some of the earlier questions. You know, we we have moved away certainly over my uh, career from uh, dumping everything on the parents and blaming the parents. Uh, at the same time, uh, parents can play a critical role, at the very least in, in observing and being aware of what their children are going through and being willing 
to intervene and get some help for them. We need to, uh, and I think some of the work that, that you're doing is really helpful in uh, diminishing the stigma and the shame attached to seeking help because uh, so many young people really can benefit from help. The question of, of whether to use medication or not is very complicated, and so many factors, and I think has to be ad addressed on an individual basis, but, but parents should not be afraid of it. And, and Tammy, um, it calls to question also not only what the parents can do, but what whole entire communities right. can do. What is, what is really the, the concept of a prevention pre prepared community? I think a prevention prepared community is willing to talk about some of these tough mm -hmm. issues, willing to work together, to have coalitions, to have groups that come together to try to support adolescents, children, um, their families. Uh, and there's a number of those that are going on in various communities ar around the, the country. And, and I think that's important to be able to feel like there's an impact that we can have. Um, and we can accomplish a lot more together in terms of supporting young, young people than we can if we try to work individually. So a prevention prepared community to me is one that's willing to talk about it, willing to put it on the table, um, willing to work together for solutions and, and to be able to support our families. Absolutely. Um, J Justin, when, when you, again, and I want to go back to your example, or at what point did your parents say um, enough? Or were you just on your own decided, I'm not going to live at home anymore, or I'm uh, going to walk away? Uh, I, I did not miraculously, if you will, decide to change that lifestyle. My parents really tried um, any tool that they could come across, whether that was recovery communities, doctors, psychiatrists, I mean, anybody. I mean, they literally just took me to my um, childhood physician to see what they could do to help. I do think about um, what Tammy had mentioned about the community. That may have been something that would have been potentially profound because if uh, in my house it wasn't acceptable. They stepped in, my, my mom and dad stepped in immediately when I consumed alcohol or drugs and there was an immediate consequence. However, I could just go to the house across the street or in the next neighborhood, and those parents had a different viewpoint. So I do think that that would have been exceptionally powerful to have a community that would have banded together and said that we aren't gonna allow our kids to have access to these things. I remember um, just a very short uh, example of that is my parents had called uh, another parent to let them know that myself and a couple of my friends were drinking at my parents' house. And I mean, that is not allowed. We clearly decided to do it anyway. But upon calling the other parents, those parents came over and they were upset. So why are you involving us with these things? We don't, we know what our kid is doing and we don't care. And I think it would have been profound if those parents would have also said, let's band together Absolutely. and see what we can do to make a difference. And Bridget, this is the whole concept of screening and brief interventions, is it not? Yeah, to, to really intervene at an earlier stage? Absolutely, and, and getting the entire community involved. So the educational system, the juvenile justice system, neighborhoods, everybody at the same table to come together and, and create ways to identify young people that need help or need intervention um, is key. And screening brief intervention, that is the whole basis for that initiative. And when we come back, we're going to be dealing with a lot more related to how we can help young people and get them into recovery. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Before, addiction and depression kept me from living my life. And now, every step I take in recovery benefits everyone. There are many options that make the road to recovery more accessible. It begins with the first step. Join the Voices for Recovery. For information and treatment referral for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I work for a virtual program with Preferred Family Healthcare, and it provides services to young people. Uh, it's technology-based, it's in a 3D environment, and it gives them the flexibility of having convenience, 
Uh, it addresses transportation difficulties to and main, uh, from mainstream outpatient treatment, and it gives them the opportunity to access resources uh, for their recovery process anytime that they choose. Our virtual world program is for the adolescent age ranges from um, 18 to 28. And it's online virtual world counseling, so you can do individual sessions as well as group sessions um, at your accessibility. So anytime that you're available to do sessions, it's kind of at your fingertips. Our premise has not ever been that virtual treatment would be better than, than traditional treatment. It has always been to be able to provide treatment to those people that have barriers to getting traditional treatment. There's many clients that are unable to access traditional treatment um, especially if they live in rural areas, uh, maybe they live 40 or 60 miles away from the nearest treatment facility, uh, maybe they've lost their license because of a DWI charge, uh, or maybe they don't have a vehicle or can't afford a vehicle, can't afford gas money. So we have found a way using the virtual world to access those clients uh, using computer technology to enter into a virtual world from their home through computer, through the internet. Um, as from our office, we're entering that same virtual environment through our computers, through the internet, and then we can meet in that virtual space. This kind of gave people an opportunity to access treatment um, based on their needs. And so they could come and if they needed to do session every day, then they could do a session every day instead of just one time a week for a couple hours a week. It's really cool because I get to wake up in the morning, I get to get my cup of coffee in my own house, and I get to go sit at my computer and I get to talk about uh, my rehabilitation with a real person over lines. And it's really easy because it works on my schedule. So when we give them a laptop computer, we uh, give them access to the internet, then uh, they now can plug in with us in a therapeutic way. It allows me to have treatment, you know, when I can't get around or, you know, I'm busy. Um, it allows me to access a counselor you know, and it's as easy as logging on, choosing an avatar, and going. People are more open, they admit quicker when they've used, uh, which is something that's very hard to do when you're sitting face to face with a, another human being, you know, your counselor. Just kind of the magic of that environment and, and invites them to be more open and honest and not be afraid when they're sitting in front of somebody else. I think the group components um, for the virtual world are very unique in the setting that we can create whatever environment that we prefer. Instead of going into a group session where I'm sitting on chairs and I'm talking to people, I get to go online and go across the world. I get to be in this big meadow field where there's uh, overlooking an ocean. You get to create your own houses and stuff if you want to. So it's really interesting because you create the environment that you do your treatment in. As time goes on and as clients continue to engage in this world, it becomes more and more realistic. So the more somebody is immersed in this environment, the more the technology starts to kind of disappear. The results of our virtual programming or our portal programs has been, by and large, as good or better than, than traditional treatment when we compare the two. In the virtual programs, we have been able to maintain people in treatment longer. We have been able to assist them to increase their recovery activities so that they're, they're engaging more in recovery activities. I hope the future brings for me and my recovery, you know, that I stay sober, I can live my life like a normal person without having, you know, the crutch or the extra weight, I guess, to carry around. The virtual world is excellent for that because um, anytime I need support or things of that nature, I just hop on, talk to my counselor, you know, and it helps with whatever problem I may have. I think that young people in my age group really enjoy uh, the virtual world program. It's kind of like a game, actually. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was exciting for me when I started because, like, I changed my avatar every single day just because it was something to do. And um, I think it's just taking the next step into technology and treatment and integrating that into an effective way for young kids to approach treatment. This is a technology-based generation and therefore um, they're, they're encountering technology on a daily basis, uh, whether it be social media, uh, courses online, schoolwork, projects. Uh, so this addresses their treatment environment in a context that they are very familiar with.
Jonathan, when and how should a parent first intervene? We've heard from Justin and his experience, mm -hmm. but overall, what, you know, we know the signs, mm -hmm. we've already talked about them. How should they intervene with, with that uh, mm -hmm. potentially problem uh, situation? You know, Tammy used an important word, which was to have the conversation. And I think that's crucial to begin to talk about what, what they see, what their concerns are, and what's going on, uh, you know, can be very challenging because, you know, as, as uh, I think Bridget and, and Justin had mentioned, you know, uh, um, adolescence is a time of experimentation, it's a time of risk taking, so, you know, one doesn't want to smother your kid or be what's referred to nowadays as a helicopter parent, which my daughter accused me of being. Oh, <laughs> but at, at the same time, one needs to have that conversation and begin to address the issues and point out what your concerns on are and, and maybe set some uh, parameters for you know, what you're looking at and, and, and follow up and see if, if things are not getting better, if you're seeing the same things that concern you, it's important to seek help, seek some kind of assessment. You know what, what I'm really troubled about is really the level of, uh, among the 18 to 26 year old at college age, the binge drinking yes. that is taking place. And we hear in the news, time in and time out, uh, what it's doing, the, the number of accidents that occur, the number, quite frankly, of, of violent, violent uh, date uh, issues that, that we're seeing, in, mm -hmm. at least in, in this area. And so, Really, what, uh, Tammy, what does a, a parent say to a child that, that wants to have fun because college should be a time when, when they're having fun? And what do you say to a child um, when, when, when they are practicing, you know, weekend binge drinking? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's important for parents to have that expectation and to, to be able to clearly say, you know, you're not, you're not of age. Um, it's important to me that you are responsible with what you're doing and the choices that you're making. Um, and I think oftentimes parents just assume it's a rite of passage, mm -hmm. that um, all college students do that. Um, and, and kids really need to understand that there's responsible drinking and then there's really harmful binge drinking. Um, and I think uh, there's some universities around the country that are doing things to try to educate students and not saying that it's okay to drink underage, but if you are drinking, then make sure that, that what you're doing and you're making good decisions about it, you're taking care of yourself, you're not putting yourself in risky situations. Um, UW-Madison in, in Madison has uh, the basics program, which they just started using this year. Um, and it's really to provide feedback and information, some brief intervention, some um, prevention, if you will, um, to help students make better decisions so that they can be happy and successful, which is what they want and it's what their parents want. And Justin, um, were, uh, was that your scenario? Did you go on to, to, to college and, and, and what did you see while you were there? Um, I got um, into college right out of high school into the Mont School of Business and was actually asked to leave a fraternity for drinking too much. So my experience... Well, that was very responsible <laughs> so, on their part. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it really was. I mean, I was drinking at such a uh, obnoxious and dangerous level that even for that kind of atmosphere, it was deemed inappropriate. And so uh, my experience in college was people were drinking. Um, they were going to classes drunk, and I think that's pretty common across the board. And so when that happens, now we know that there's an option for someone who really wants to, that has had a problem, really continuing college through uh, the sober dorms, et cetera. You want to talk to us a little bit about that, Justin? Yeah. I've been able to meet some people here on the East Coast that have been involved in different organizations like Association for Recovery Schools, um, which is a phenomenal program. And uh, I didn't have any access to anything like that at the campus that I went to. Uh, and I didn't know that those things were even, uh, were even out there. But I believe that those programs were also something that could have been pivotal in my potential recovery to know that those programs existed. 
And not only for college students, but for high school students mm -hmm. as well. There's recovery schools. Um, a lot of them are attached to uh, a high school and part of it, mm -hmm. but there's more and more of those around the country that are helping students uh, be able to tr transition back to high school, which was their, mm -hmm. you know, that's where they used. Mm -hmm. So being able to have a safe, sober environment is really important for adolescents and, and for college students. And, and it's very important that parents, to get back to your initial question, Eva, that parents are supportive of the efforts on the part of the school system and or the college. Uh, unfortunately, we run into many parents who are just so focused on wanting, uh, 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 being concerned about their child's record and something being on the record mm -hmm. that they uh, immediately take this adversarial stance and they want to just uh, sweep it under the rug and, and not be supportive of getting that help. Well, that's, that's sad. And, and I think it's really important that we also train and educate our faculty members, mm -hmm. our administrators at different mm -hmm. schools, so that every school becomes almost a recovery school and, and stigma is reduced about the mm -hmm. for young people. Yeah. And I think this is particularly important for different cultures and um, genders because mm -hmm. there's definitely different differential asso uh, stigma associated. Beyond the colleges um, I, I, uh, uh, and, and, and the staff within the colleges, so let's talk a little bit about uh, primary health care and, and its role. Should physicians, um, Bridget, be concerned, you know, when, when they're treating a, a, a young person or a young adult with these issues? I think that's an important piece to um, recovery and getting people the help that they need. Certainly physicians should be screening as much as they can. There's a, a number of very short screeners that are mm -hmm. used to actually identify people in need of treatment. Um, and then um, just offering even training physicians on how to do a brief motivational interviewing session. Mm -hmm. um, I know time is always of the essence, but this really can reduce some of the other associated health care health consequences associated. And, and also helping the primary care physician avoid being an enabler. Uh, you know, unfortunately, again, we see... How so? Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Well, we see oftentimes uh, that the uh, parents, if a parent will bring a child to the physician or if the child goes to their own uh, physician, uh, that the uh, sometimes the uh, substance abuse is hidden or masked under the uh, the, the label of oh it's it's a physical problem they're stressed out they you know they they need to do something uh, to address this physical issue and not looking at the uh, the behavior behind it which may be causing the symptoms. Which could also be a mental health issue, and yes. and and so, you know, I want to get back to that. Um, how how do um, parents who recognize that there may be a behavioral problem, how do they deal with it in terms of um, getting them the right type of help for a mental health uh, problem, Jonathan? The, uh, I think the key is to uh, not be intimidated by the stigma or concerned about it. There's so many young people today who are coming forward and getting the help they need for anxiety, depression, other kind bipolar uh, disorders, and uh, it's crucial to do that. Uh, they shouldn't be afraid of that or feel that their child will be marked by that. I think that um, uh, schools, camps, uh, travel programs, all of these programs, anyone who works in these settings for youth will tell you that uh, a growing percentage of the young people who take part in these programs are under the care of a mental health or behavioral health practitioner, maybe receiving some kind of helpful medication. And so the stigma is really diminishing, and I think parents need to have some trust in that. So Jonathan, you've assessed uh, a patient that comes in, have talked to the parents, they're willing to do it. What, what types of programs would you recommend for, for, for depression, let's say, if, if a, a young person comes in with, with that problem? Well, I think the, you know, in terms of evidence-based work, uh, the cognitive behavioral therapies are, are really very effective. Uh, you know, there's a whole range of them. There's uh, trauma-focused uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. There's dialectical. And what would that entail, more or less? Well, uh, I think all of these programs tr uh, seek to build healthy young people. They seek to create a, an awareness, a mindfulness, if you will, about 
what the young person is experiencing. So, so the, the teen knows what they're feeling. Are they depressed? Are they anxious? Are they stressed out? Uh, maybe uh, pressuring themselves to achieve. And being aware of that, then they can begin to learn effective coping skills and behaviors. And Tammy, I think that's a very key issue is to get the person that's affected or, or that needs the intervention to even begin to identify what they're feeling. I think that's that's a critical point. Yeah, and, and I think even to kind of take it beyond that, to be able to then feel like they can do something to change it. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I like motivational interviewing and, and using that approach so much because it instills that sense in, in folks that they can do something different, they have different options, um, and being able to really partner with them and help them figure out what's going to work for them. Um, because what might work for one person is going to be very different from what w would work for the next person. Um, and being able to help people figure out what changes they can make, how to sustain whatever changes they're doing, um, and how to make that really incorporated into their life. To me, that's, that's where true recovery comes into play, when you can actually take the skills and the strategies that you're learning and then use them. Absolutely, and I'm glad you mentioned recovery because that's gonna be the subject of our next panel. We'll be right back. a drug or alcohol problem, your whole world stops making sense. You can get help for yourself or a loved one and make sense of life again. For information, treatment referral, and most importantly, help, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The recovery program at Rutgers is a unique program that includes housing for students. Right now in New Brunswick we can hold 38 students and in Newark we can hold 8 students. The housing in New Brunswick has been around since 1988. The recovery program itself started around 1983 under Lisa Leitman. Our program and the recovery house we describe as not a, a treatment program. This isn't like going to rehab. What the recovery house is is a residence hall which supports people in recovery. Students have to be sober at least 90 days to get in. You know, I prefer longer time than that, and, but they made a commitment to recovery, and they're in 12-step programs. Whether they go to A or NA doesn't matter, but they need to go to one or the other a few times a week and have a sponsor. I'm Devin Fox. Um, I'm a person who's in long-term recovery. What that means for me is that I haven't used a drink or a drug in over three years, and uh, recovery is really providing me with a life that's really worth living something that I never had before. To look at my dreams that I thought were totally dead, totally dead. I didn't think I was gonna go back to school. I didn't think I was gonna graduate with my bachelor's. I didn't think I was gonna go right back into my master's to get my MSW. But that's what this house gave me, the opportunity to do that. It doesn't keep me clean, but like it gave me the idea that like, oh wait, I can do something better. When someone walks into a recovery house and they're in recovery themselves, uh, they get an instant sense of being at home and familiarity, like it's uh, truly a day of homecoming for them. They get a sense of feeling of safety and belonging, which on a college campus with uh, 48,000 people, uh, many of whom are partying on a Thursday or Friday night, to have other people that are you know, like you and have kind of the same experiences and um, the same kind of desires and motivations moving forward, it's really nice. You don't feel different. You feel a part of something and you can really help each other you know, grow and change. And once I had a year sober, that's when I moved into the recovery house. Um, they had some space available. I jumped at the opportunity. I waited a year and I came back here. I was nervous to come back because I did all my drinking here. Most of my drinking was at Rutgers. So a year was good and coming in here and being around other people who are in recovery was really helpful for me to get my footing back into school. My grades were not so great in the beginning, so it took me 
you know, a little while for that. We do a really full assessment, and so even students who present with pretty severe drug and alcohol problems are also screened for mental health problems. And so part of their recovery plan when they come here is not only that they have a program of recovery, you know, they go to 12-step meetings, they have a sponsor, but they also have a plan for maintaining their mental health. It's not just about being a student here and getting a degree. We want you to really learn something, but at the same token, we want you to be a well-rounded human being. So when students get sober, though, and they come here, look around at other people partying, they say, well, I don't know what I like to do for fun. So part of the things that um, our office here does uh, in uh, coordination with some of the alumni is help students have fun. I can tell you for sure I would not have graduated from Rutgers without, you know, having, you know, lived here. I think if I had lived in a, you know, this like, solemn like house where everybody just kind of came and it, there, there's lots of fun that happen here you know I believe there's video game football being played downstairs right now which I will be partaking in later tonight there's always people around to talk to and staying up until three o'clock in the morning I could still be a college student and I didn't have to be drinking at three o'clock in the morning on a Friday night um, we talked about any other thing or what was going on. We could watch movies. You know, it was the college experience for me. I think there are a lot of ways to track success. I tend to be more um, concerned with quality of life issues than I am with actual days of sobriety, although I think that's important. A lot of our students go to graduate school, go on to law school, medical school, veterinary school. I mean, we have very successful graduates out there and I don't think if they hadn't gotten sober at a young age that that would have been possible. So Justin, how can we um, support young people in recovery? You had mentioned earlier recovery schools. Mm -hmm. What other areas can, can we look at? I think one of the most, uh, the single most pivotal moment in my recovery was the power of an opportunity. It was one person, one story, teaching me that my story and my past didn't have to define me for the rest of my life. And I was given an opportunity to lead and empower other people, even though I was clearly imperfect and I had made mistakes. But it was in that night in November of 2007, my, night, my life changed by that one individual saying, you can do this and you who, can- Who said that to uh, you? His name was Nicholas Gurk. And he was a 26 year old who used to volunteer at the rehabilitation program that I was staying in. And he didn't take me to a meeting, he didn't take me to a seminar. He took me back to his house and we just talked and he just let me know what I could do to change my life. And from that, from that night until today, you know, I, I'm here and I haven't given up. I'm not perfect, but I have been able to communicate a message of hope to people, whether it's been in, with a situation like this here today or one-on-one -on -one with parents and family members. And that was the single most important thing that happened to me in my recovery. And currently, are you engaged in other peer-type support uh, initiatives? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a grassroots movement happening across the nation right now called Young People in Recovery. And this movement, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, of course, um, but we're able to uh, raise awareness and advocate and develop skills for young people to help other young people seek recovery and definitely, definitely reduce the stigma around that. And Tammy, talk a little bit more about other aspects of supporting young people in recovery to make sure that they sustain their sobriety. I think one of the things that um, is really important not to miss is, you know, kids need to have fun. And if the only fun that you have is when you're using, then being sober is not going to be very appealing to that particular group. Um, so one of the things that we try to do um, at Connections is to try to, to have sober fun activities that people can be involved in every day. We have a huge mentor group um, where people, when they've obtained some sobriety, they can become a mentor and they can give back. And we have people who stick around um, for a really long time because they benefit as much as the, the newer folks coming in. So I think being able to create that community, that support, um, to be able to see other people doing it is really important, especially other people your age doing That's it. That's correct. And why is that important, Jonathan, to get people to really be engaged in planning their own uh, sustainable road in, in recovery? Well, you know, there's um, a term we use a lot in social work, you know, that, that you need to own the, the problem or the challenge. And I think 
it's very motivating. You know, Justin spoke very movingly about, you know, owning that and, and taking that responsibility. And uh, that's really crucial. It's also very developmentally appropriate for uh, teens and young adults because that's what they're doing. They're exploring and they are defining who they are, what their values are, how they handle situations. So this fits beautifully in with that challenge for them. I also want, just wanted to mention about peer support. Uh, working uh, very primarily with the Jewish community, there are many Jewish holidays that stress uh, enjoying the, and, and having fun and drinking wine. There's a myth that Jews don't have these problems, which is completely untrue. But uh, what, what we do, for instance, in terms of an upcoming holiday, which star starts next week, Purim, the celebration of, of uh, Jews avoiding getting killed uh, you know, in the old days, uh, and, and there's a tradition that people have to drink uh, heavily on that. It's, it's a misunderstanding of the text about it, but nonetheless it, it's quite popular. And we specifically hold youth events, sober Purim events, so that young people can celebrate it. And kids say to us, uh, just as, as you mentioned, Tammy, they said, my gosh, this is the first time in five years that I've celebrated this holiday in sobriety. And you know what? I had fun. And that's a critical point for them. Absolutely. And Bridget, we can also talk about not only the, the, the peer support, but peer support can be uh, gotten in many ways. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the new technologies, the new media, and what young people are doing through new media in order to support each other. It's a fabulous question. And again, I think it's so developmentally appropriate and uh, appropriate for how young people are communicating these days, as you mentioned about Facebook and Twitter. Um, young people connect via technology, and um, so social networking sites, uh, cell phone technology, text messaging, these types of um, technologies can be very powerful either to create a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program or support program and or uh, through some type of adult sponsored uh, program for young people. And Justin, there are some existing efforts where people can blog, go in. I know that we at the Recovery Month site, uh, the Recovery Month gov site, have um, uh, opportunities for people to go in and connect with others. Talk to us uh, specifically about young people in recovery and what might be available. Hmm. Well, actually, right now on uh, the Young People in Recovery Facebook, you can go on there and ask questions and see what kind of services that we can connect other people with and, and facilitate those services or ask those questions that they may not be ready to ask somewhere else, but they can say, hey, is this, is what I'm doing, is this really a problem or would you consider me an alcoholic or a drug addict? And provides that safe way to ask questions. Um, they can send us message or messages or emails or anything like that. And so again, this, this movement, one of the great things that we wanted to do through it was have a movement of a movement for young people by young people. So there, there isn't a single person that's a part of it that isn't somebody like myself. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a ton more Justins out there and some great people aside from me who are making these things happen across the country. And I think it acts as, as a standalone almost just being inspirational by being that model of recovery and that life can be extraordinary. I don't have enough time to go into it, but my, you know, my life today is absolutely extraordinary. And my father just turned 60, year, 60 years old a couple of weeks ago, and he was able to call me and thank me for what I have shown him, what a life can be about, and that's a gift. Absolutely, absolutely. There are, of course, um, other uh, options um, where, where folks can go in. There's in the rooms, and there's quite a, uh, a number of, of, of areas where I think they can create even subgroups. Uh, within those that can be just for, by, and about young people. Correct, Jonathan? Absolutely. In fact, uh, we have um, uh, one of the, the most helpful activities that uh, many of our young people do is that they get together and they go to young people's AA meetings and, you know, they will text each other or, ch or make plans to meet through Facebook uh, or Twitter and, and go together and it's, it's tremendously reinforcing. It really helps them. And within the mental health community, I think there yes. are some that, that folks who, are, who may be co-existing conditions Absolutely. or co-occurring can either choose to go into the, um, 
the the recovery for right. addiction or recovery for mental health, correct? Or they can go to the groups that are called Double Trouble. <laughs> is, it, is it really one yeah. that's called Double Trouble? Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Talk to me a little bit about that. I'm not too well. Well, you know, I, I think again, as as uh, our knowledge has has expanded and the stigma has decreased, you know, I, people are are finding out that uh, there are many factors which have uh, contributed to their substance abuse, mm -hmm. and certainly a whole range of affective disorders, of of emotional disorders, uh, whether it's depression whether it's a bipolar disorder, can, can really uh, precipitate or, or, or uh, aggravate uh, substance use. So, you know, being able to go and, and really be, be more open about that is really crucial. In the old days, I remember going, going way back, you know, it was, it was almost uh, forbidden to talk about, you know, to seeing your therapist or, God forbid, taking medication and so on. And that, that has tremendously changed, and I think that's for the mm -hmm. better. And Tammy, talk to me about how can family and friends best support someone that's in recovery? I think um, for family and friends to be willing to talk about it, to be willing to be part of the solution, um, to not necessarily um, pretend it's not there or hope it goes away or assume that the person can handle it, um, to really be willing to be part of the team, to be part of the, the solution for that person. And, and one of my hopes is we're, t we're talking about so many different uh, ways that people can come into the system and into support. And I hope we can get to a point where there's no wrong door for somebody to enter, whether it's mental health issues or substance use issues or bullying or any of that, wherever you come into contact with the system, that you can get um, to the right place and to the mm -hmm. to folks who can support you. Um, and double trouble to me is, mm -hmm. hey, we, we, can, we have two issues that we need to deal with, but we don't have to work twice as hard. Exactly. We can use some of the same coping skills and strategies to deal with both both. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to remind our audience that National Recovery Month mm -hmm. is celebrated every September. And we hope that if you're in this audience and you've heard what is said here, if you're a young person that has a problem, you can certainly call our hotline for help. If you're someone that's in recovery, you can certainly look towards uh, recoverymonth.gov for information and uh, connectedness with those that are in recovery. And we really want the young people, uh, young adults and, and youth to really get more connected and find uh, people that are similar, that are doing a tremendous amount to reduce stigma and to continue to celebrate their recovery. Thank you for being here, it was a great show. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the Free Recovery Month Kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain your copy of this year's Recovery Month Kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.